Good afternoon, everybody. I want to welcome you to our fourth virtual community conversation. And this is a series that we started oh, at the beginning of the pandemic that we developed to explore contemporary issues while working to build and strengthen the Brown community in the midst of a time where, for the most part, we're required to be physically apart. Uh, our first few events specifically dealt with the impacts of the pandemic. And I've said many times this year, we could easily talk about the pandemic and nothing else this year, and that would not be a good idea because there are so many other important and overlapping issues simultaneously facing our country that also deserve our time and attention. Not that we won't talk at all about the pandemic today, uh, but you know, I'm thinking about things like racial and social upheaval and a very, very contentious presidential election that's just a few weeks away. Today, I am very pleased to welcome someone who is well positioned to talk to us about all of these issues and specifically the challenges facing the media and the role of journalism in democracy. And that's Jeff Zucker, chairman of Warner Media News and Sports and president of CNN Worldwide. Uh, Jeff oversees all of Warner Media's live programming, including all divisions of CNN Worldwide and Turner Sports. And since joining CNN, which I have to say was founded by Brown alum Ted Turner, uh, Jeff has overseen a dramatic turnaround of the global news network and developed it into the most, most used digital news and information outlet in the world. He serves as the domestic channels manager, manager, managing editor, uh, setting the daily news agenda across item, across platforms. Uh, Jeff saw, just a little bit of background, he saw success from a very young age. He took over NBC's Today Show at the age of 26 and reinvented the morning news program. And under his leadership, the Today Show became the most watched morning news program in America. His career at NBC began in sports as a researcher for the NBC sports coverage of the 1998 Summer Olympics Games in Seoul, South Korea. And he went on to have a 25 year career at NBC Universal, where he rose to the ranks to become the company's president and CEO. He headed up the global media and entertainment company, which included the NBC Broadcast Network, its news and sports division, and all of its cable properties, Universal Pictures, and the Universal Theme Park. So that's just a bit of a biography of somebody who's had an amazing career. Uh, he is also a five-time Emmy Award winner. And I should say the most important thing is he's also a proud Brown parent. And so we're, we're really thrilled. I'm really thrilled to have him here today. So, Jeff, thanks so much for joining. Uh, I'm going to start out with a conversation between the two of us. Uh, we're going to focus on the media, the pandemic, a little bit about uh, the elections, but I expect we'll get more into that when we come to the Q&A with the audience members. So thanks for being here. Well, thank you for having me. I'm really, I'm really thrilled to be with you. Let's start with a, a few questions about just background about you. And you know, you started out covering sports. You went on to have a very successful career at NBC and now CNN. And you know, what what drew you to the media? Uh, what keeps you in the industry? Well, uh, you know, look, I I from a very young age, I was always attracted to to journalism, uh, and. Uh, you know, I worked worked in, in journalism when I was in high school. I, I wrote for my high school newspaper. I worked for the Miami Herald. Uh, I went uh, I went to Harvard. Uh, I apologize for that, but uh, uh, at Harvard, I was the president of the Harvard Crimson, and so which was the student newspaper there. So you know, I've always had this affinity for for news and journalism. I love sports, and so that's always been a, a part of my life as well. I think I was just always drawn to, uh, I was always drawn to uh, information, news, storytelling. And what keeps me motivated today is that, uh, you know, journalism is just the first draft of history. I love history. And, uh, and I love knowing what's going on today. And I think that's what keeps me coming back. Even though I've been doing this for 35 years, uh, I still want to know what's going to happen today. I still want to know what's going to happen tomorrow. And I still want to be part of that first draft of history. That, that's great. So I want to come back at the end to kind of your advice for current sure. students who are thinking about careers in media and journalism. But 
you know, it has changed a lot since you've started. And one of the things that we've seen in recent years is this steady increase in the dissemination of misinformation uh, through, you know, standard media as well as social media uh, that's become a major threat to public trust and democracy and distrust of the media. Yeah. So, you know, one question for you is how do you, how do you deal with this as you're running a news organization? What's the challenge? Do you have any ways to kind of really regain the trust? Or maybe I'm wrong at saying there is a lack of trust. Yeah, well, it's an interesting question, and a lot of people do come at it with that assumption. Uh, and there's no question there's been uh, some erosion uh, of trust. But, you know, when people say they don't trust the media anymore, uh, you know, that's a little bit like people saying, uh, I don't like Congress, I hate Congress, but I love my congressman, right? And they keep reelecting their congressman. And so there is a very similar thing here about media, which is, oh, the media can't be trusted, yet I keep do coming back to the source, my media source. For instance, I'll give you an example, CNN this year. This will be the most watched year in the history of CNN since Ted Turner, that Brown alum, founded it 40 years ago, right? This will be the most watched year in 40 years. If they, if they didn't trust CNN, they wouldn't come to us in those numbers bigger than they've ever come to us. Same on the digital side. We, we, we're the most used digital news site in the world, right? If they didn't trust us, that wouldn't be the case this year. So look, do I think that there has been erosion of, of trust in, in, uh, in media? I do, and I think that there are there are uh, many reasons for that. I think the advent of the internet, I think the advent of social media, I do think the bully pulpit uh, uh, of the current administration attacking media and attacking facts, I think all of that has hurt trust in, in, in overall media. Um, but I think people do find that in that kind of world, they need to rely on sources they can trust. And I do think that's why places like CNN and others are experiencing such uh, renaissances right now because they are seeking out places that they know they can trust. And we say at CNN, look, uh, the most important thing we have is our brand and, our, and those three little red letters that Ted Turner formed. And, uh, and that stands for quality and trust. And it can be easily lost and not easily gained. And that's why we do, we do pay so much attention to information, quality journalism, and try to combat the misinformation that is out there because of the internet and social media and, and others who are trying to do a disservice. So, but, I mean, that's, that's, that kind of le leads into another issue, I guess, which is, and it's kind of like Congress is terrible, but I love my member of Congress. Right. And people, you know, you hear all the time that people gravitate to yeah. news outlets that fit their political be beliefs. So we're just creating these big echo chambers. Yeah. And, and if you look at statistics on political polarization in the country, we're at not, I mean, those yeah. are data I know are real. We're at an all time yeah. high. Yeah. So how, do you, how do you think about combating yeah. that or can anyone? Look, I think, look I, think, I think it's a very real and big challenge. And, and I do think, you know, I do think there are several reasons that have contributed to the polarization and that have contributed to people going to their, their favorite media source. I think, uh, I do think that uh, uh, social media ha has uh, played a role and has a responsibility that I don't think that they have necessarily lived up to in policing disinformation and agendas. I do think gerrymandering, and I know this is getting now a little, but, okay, but I think, you can go into politics. No, but I do think I do think gerrymandering has has played a role because people go to Congress and they go to basically safe seats. Ninety five percent of the seats in Congress now are safe because of the way the, the lines are drawn. And so they only need to go to Congress and then uh, not compromise and only appear on uh, whatever media outlet uh, plays to their uh, preconceived political beliefs. So I think the combination of social media, I think uh, gerrymandering and uh, 
and the current administration, which has so devalued journalism, information, and science, uh, has really hurt this. So how do we get how do we get back to that? How do we get out of that? Well, look, I think there needs to be uh, I think there needs to be more self regulation in social media. I think gerrymandering needs to be dealt with. And I think there has to be uh, a recognition at the highest levels of government that uh, science and facts do matter. Well, that's something universities uh, would, would agree with you on. Um, you, you know, what, one of the other things that's kind of related is, you know, you see the growth of organizations like CNN that are broadcasting to the globe, which is great. Uh, but at the same time, we've seen just this destruction in local news. Yeah. So, you know, one statistic, 2019 AP analysis, more than 1,400 towns and cities in the U.S. lost a newspaper in the past 15 yeah. years. How, and, you know, CNN can't do local news, so how, or maybe you can. And you raise a good point, though, because CNN uh, actually relies on local local affiliates and local TV stations and local organizations to, uh, to help us in covering stories wherever they happen, whether they happen, you know, we don't have a bureau in Providence, right? But we have local affiliates in Providence who do help us. And, mm -hmm. and then in rural, rural parts of Montana, right? We don't have people or bureaus there, but we rely on local affiliates. So these, these local news, uh, uh, the, the loss of local news organizations is a real problem. And you know, the, the other reason that it's a huge problem is, you know who holds the local city council responsible and holds them to account? Is the local newspaper or the local news organization. Who holds the state capital to account? It's the, it's the local uh, state news organizations. And without them, the opportunities for uh, malfeasance and corruption and mistakes uh, multiply. And that is a huge problem for a democracy. And that's a huge problem for this country. Now, I don't know that there's anything CNN per se can do about it. But I think as a society, it is something that we need to be much more conscious of. And, and, and that we need to uh, uh, encourage those who do have the means to help fund and support local journalism, there, there's very little else that's as important in journalism today as making sure that we, uh, that we fund those local, local journalistic organizations. Because otherwise, you know, the role, the role of CNN and the role of, of, I think, national media organizations is to hold those who are in power to account, right? That's, I believe, the way that, 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 that that's what we're supposed to do. And that's what I see as our fundamental job. And that's why some people obviously then attack us because they don't want to be held to account. But if we don't do that on local and state levels, uh, then, then I think that we all run the risk uh, of problems. Just like, you know, I would say that the, the local school newspaper at Brown is there to, to hold, you know. The oh, and they do, believe exactly. me. Exactly. And, and by the way, and, and, and I'm sure you don't always like it. No. And right, exactly. But that's actually healthy. That's healthy for Brown, yes. just as it's healthy for, you know, pro the, the, the Providence uh, local organizations to hold the Providence City Council and, and the state government responsible. Mm -hmm. and, and if we don't do that, then, then America is going to lose. Well, I tell my students that I read the Brown Daily Herald. It's the first paper I read every morning. So well, I, there, there you go. go. And I there think that's, that's great to hear. <laughs> So, so just one more general topic of question on the media, which I think is kind of just an interesting factoid and maybe it's affects you or not. Um, so there's a recent Microsoft study and shows that people now generally start to lose concentration in whatever they're doing after about eight seconds. And it's a figure that's been falling for I'm sorry, years. I'm sorry, I lost focus. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, I can't remember what I was asking you. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> okay. Exactly. So how do, like, do you, I, I guess one question is, do you think the media is at all responsible for that? Probably not. But how do you, how do you grapple with that? Does that mean you can't do in-depth reporting? Or? Yeah. Look, I, I, I don't really think the media is responsible for that. I think there are a lot of things that have developed in society, right? I mean, it's the, 
you know, it, it, it's the phone you hold in your hand. It's the, it's, it's social media, it's TikTok, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's all of the, you know, it's the internet itself. It, it, it's, you know, look, it's the, it's the advent of, of all of these new uh, forms of communication and, and distribution that we're dealing with that I think have contributed to shorter attention spans. It's a reality. I don't really think necessarily that, you know, the media per se is, is responsible for that, but it is a reality. Now, listen, we have different distribution platforms, right? We have digital, uh, our digital platforms, we have our television linear distribution platforms. I think that we can cater to different, uh, uh, different sensibilities at different times, right? That uh, through, through our digital platforms, we can, have, uh, we can have stories and videos and storytelling for, uh, for, for different audiences and for different, um, uh, for people who, who don't wanna have a long attention span. But look, you know, this, uh, this past Sunday night, we did an hour documentary on the way the world sees America. That's not for a short attention span. So my point is, uh, I think it's incumbent upon us to, to do smart, good programming and, uh, and I think that people will stay with it as long as it's good and compelling and interesting. You know, just because just we do television uh, doesn't mean that it should be boring, I always say, right? And so it's incumbent upon us uh, to make sure that what we are presenting is informative and interesting so that we do keep the audience's interest. And I don't think we should apologize for, uh, for wanting our presentation to be interesting. And, uh, no. and I, think, I think people sometimes say, oh, you know, there they go again, they're, they're, they're trying to make it entertaining. And I don't think that just because information is presented in an entertaining and interesting way is something that we should apologize for. Right, and have you seen that as a change in the news? I mean, I remember as a kid, the news was something where, you know, Walter Cronkite was right. sitting there reading a piece of yeah. paper at you and it was deadly dull. And yeah. it was in black and white. Look, you know, people always say, oh, the good old days, right? Oh. You know, th things were never quite what, what we remember them to be. Has thi have things changed? Of course they have. Ha but, you know, but, but technology has changed and, and, and distribution has changed and, and presentation has changed and graphics have changed and, and, and everything's changed. And by the way, you know, things evolve. And there's, you know, and again, I think people always long for what it, the way it was. And when Walter Cronkite was the one di person who disseminated the news, you know, listen, we're better off today because we have so many sources of news and information. Now, some of them may provide misinformation back to where we started this conversation. I think it's, it's incumbent upon, you know, st your students, uh, people in society to educate themselves, figure out what, what is reliable, and then, to, uh, and then to rely upon that which is reliable. And, and that's, uh, and I think that, just because something was the way it was before doesn't mean it was necessarily better. Just a question that came in through the, um, through the Q&A, which I'll sneak in now, which is, Great. how do you stay ahead of the curve in regard to media and technological innovation? So yeah. it is fast changing. Yeah, it, it is. It is uh, it's a good question. And it, it's probably the biggest thing that's changed over the last five to 10 years because technology has, has changed everything. Um, Look, on a personal level, I try to, uh, I try to listen and, and, and learn. By the way, I, 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 learn, uh, uh, I learn from my kids, right? I see what they're, uh, what they're using and what they're uh, dealing with. I, I learn from people I work with. I think the biggest, the biggest change from my seat is that we're not just a media company anymore. We're also a technology company. And, and the biggest change that we've made in the last five years is that we've hired a lot of people out of tech and technology and, uh, and not just journalists per se. And, and so we have to, we have, we've had to hire a, an entirely different kind of a person uh, to help us keep up, right? So like I can't personally do it and be aware of everything that's changing mm -hmm. and, and happening. But we need a new, new type of person who works at CNN. We now have technologists who work at CNN in a way we never did before. And that's how I keep up and make sure that the company stays ahead. And, and so, you know, I, maybe we'll talk a little bit later. 
you mentioned about advice to people who want to be in the media business. But one of the things I say is it's not just a business anymore for people who want to go out and cover the news. It's also a business for people who code and, uh, uh, data. and, and understand data and understand yeah. technology. And, and I think that's a big change for people to realize. You're going to be hiring Brown computer science students? Or totally. No, listen, I, I, think that, I think that is an opportunity. I do think that, uh, I do think in the media space now, uh, uh, you know, people who study coding and study technology and study uh, computer science, uh, absolutely, if they want, right? I mean, if they want, yeah. Uh, this is new, a new avenue for them that probably was not the case 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although you still want people who understand history and know how to write. A hundred percent. Well, I, when we talk about that, I'll get to that in a moment. Okay, yes. okay, good, good. So uh, a couple questions about the pandemic. And I, could you just, I mean, you, you've been covering this. This is the biggest story for a long time. Yeah. It kind of came at us slowly and then ramped up with a lot of changing information. Yeah. How, how, what was your approach to covering it? How has it changed over time? Yeah. What's it been like? Yeah, so obviously, look, we've been dealing with this all year. Look, at CNN, because we do have a, a, a very vibrant uh, international channel and, uh, and, and a lot of people based in, in China uh, and Hong Kong, uh, you know, we were aware of what was going on in Wuhan pretty early on, uh, you know, back, back in January. Now, obviously, it hadn't made its way to the United States yet, so it wasn't a big story on our U.S. channel. But, but we, were, we were covering this, you know, uh, as a story in China before, you know, obviously, it, it, it developed here in the United States. Um, and then come, you know, by March, uh, this was clearly becoming a story. And we, having seen what had happened in China and what was happening in, in the, around the globe, you know, we, we really did see that this was uh, becoming a global pandemic. And, and actually, we were starting to call it a pandemic before the World, World Health Organization did. And I remember I would lead our daily editorial call every day and say, this is a pandemic. And, and there was a little bit of a reluctance on, our, on, on the part of some of our teams because the World Health Organization hadn't called it there yet. So we did see this in part because of our global nature. Um, then obviously by, by the middle of March, uh, it clearly uh, took over in the United States. And I will say um, this has been, you know, I, I've covered, you know, Gulf Wars and, and uh, presidential elections and, and frankly, every story of the last 30 years. I, I would say that this is as big as any story that, that I've ever covered and been a part of. It has pretty much been our lead story every day for seven months. Uh, we lead our daily editorial call every day with the latest on COVID, mm -hmm. even in the face of what is happening right now with the presidential election. Uh, and, and, uh, and so we have been, uh, I would say COVID has been 90% uh, of our coverage since March. And on a global basis, right? Because we are a global organization. Yeah. And it really has been a global story. Now, obviously, in recent months, it's been predominantly in the U.S. for us. But, but we have covered this 90% of our coverage for the last seven to eight months. It's probably the biggest story that, that we've ever covered. And, uh, and I think, sadly, it's going to be here for, for, for some time to come. So, you know, one of the other things that's been going on, in addition to the election, in addition to COVID, are uh, protests and really concerns around race in right. America. And, you know, in recent months, we've seen some pretty horrific violence against Black Americans, and it's led to widespread protests and demonstrations. Uh, you know, just, I want to talk to you about this generally, but there have been journalists who have been injured while covering the protests. Uh, the CNN Center in Atlanta was vandalized. How, are you, how do you see safety for journalists in the context of this? Or you, is right. this part of doing their job? Is any special concerns there? Yeah, well, look, I mean, I, I often get asked, what do I worry about the most in my job? Uh, and I've been asked this, you know, for the eight years that I've been here. And I always say it's the safety of our journalists. And 
Usually when I was saying that, it was about those who were in war zones yep. uh, overseas and, and covering, you know, conflict. And, you know, we've obviously had issues uh, around the globe. Sadly, uh, this last year or for the last couple of years, uh, I worry about that as much at home here. And, uh, and, and that's in large part, and I'll get to what's happened in the United States in the last, you know, in this, during the summer uh, with, the, with the unrest and, and the attacks. But, you know, for the last three or four years, the attacks on journalists at political rallies and, and then being singled out, you know, we are now at, you know, anytime we're at a, at a, a, a Trump uh, event, uh, we're with serious security. And I worry tremendously about the security uh, of our journalists there. And they are huge targets in a way that I worry as much about that as I, I do our, our foreign correspondents in war zones. And that is a really terrible and unfortunate development. Now, with regard to covering the uh, events that, that have uh, come to the fore this summer and this year be, uh, because of the terrible events that have, have taken place, look, uh, that has also been a, a tremendous cause of, of concern for the safety of our journalists who are covering it. Uh, in fact, we had a reporter uh, in Minneapolis who was arrested live on the air uh, while he was broadcasting, right, for absolutely no reason. And, you know, and I had to call the, the governor of Minnesota, uh, you know, twice that morning within two hours uh, and tell him how outrageous the behavior of, of the police, the state police had been. And clearly it was a mistake and clearly that got uh, fixed. But, you know, so our reporters are in harm's way covering this. Uh, now, listen, that is what our reporters often want to do, right? You know, people who go into this business want to often, uh, like first responders and, and, and those who are there to protect, want to run into the fire and want to run to the war and want to run to the, to the, to the, to the story on the streets. But it is a, a huge concern for us now, uh, the safety of our people. And, uh, and it is something that we spend an extraordinary amount of time. And now we're also dealing not just with physical safety uh, of covering these events, but now we're dealing with, you know, the safety, the health uh, of our people who are covering the White House or covering, you know, political rallies and things like that. And listen, now we're dealing with things we never thought we would have to deal with about can we send a reporter to, to, to be in a, a an interview with the president of the United States, you know, and the chief of staff of the White House refuses to do an interview with his mask on. Can we put our camera folks and reporters in that position? And so, you know, there's that kind of security that we're now and yeah. safety, frankly, that we're never could, have imagined never could have imagined that we would be dealing with. Yeah, no, it's crazy. So, so on the, on the, some of the issues around racism and diversity, Sure. Uh, many companies, universities uh, as well, are being called upon to diversify their, their yeah. teams, their employees. Sure. And uh, newsrooms are overwhelmingly staffed by white men. Uh, there's a 2018 study by Pew, more than three quarters of newsroom employees identified as non-Hispanic and white. This isn't just CNN, this is- yeah, no, no, no. And I actually, yeah, no, I understand. About 60% are men. So, so how do you, I, I guess the question is, how do you think this affects the coverage? Yeah, yeah. And, and then what can, what can, what are you doing about it? What can other news organizations do about yeah, it? Yeah, well, look, I think this is a real, a, a very real uh, issue. Uh, obviously affects, you know, as you said, universities and, and institutions and, and businesses, and it absolutely affects the media. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, editorial decisions that get, met, that get met made are impacted by who's making them, you know? And so I think it is incumbent upon me and my leadership team to be uh, at the forefront of making sure that there is better representation across the board, on the air, off the air, those who are making decisions, correspondents who are in the field. Look, you know, at CNN, we, I think we've done uh, a, a really good job 
of making sure that our correspondents on the air are incredibly diverse. Um, but we need to do even more on our anchors. With our anchors, we need to do better. Uh, I've, you know, we've laid out goals internally at CNN as to, you know, uh, how we want to get there off the air as well. I think we've made a lot of progress, and we have we have much more to do. Um, uh, and and then you know, and by the way, we've talked a lot uh, this summer, and rightly so, about uh, racial diversity. And, and making sure that that's both on the air and off the air. But I think that we also have to be conscious of gender diversity. I think we have to be conscious of uh, political diversity, economic diversity, uh, geographic diversity. You know, again, and I'm not minimizing the need to uh, uh, make sure that we get the racial diversity first and foremost right, but, but you know, uh, we also can't have people who are making decisions all come from the same background, uh, all come from the same place, uh, urban and rural, right? There are, there are just different things that I think that, that we need to spend more time thinking about. And, I, and I'm sure that's the case, you know, when, when you're putting together a college campus. Absolutely. And it comes back to something we talked about earlier, which is, the role of local news organizations, yeah. which yeah, is that's what sure. gives you diversity of experience coming exactly. in. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So look, I, I want to open it to the uh, audience for Q&A in one minute. I want to ask you uh, one question, which is, uh, so as you noted, back in your college days, you were the president of the Harvard Crimson. And as you know, we have a very active student newspaper here in the BDH which has produced CNN journalists. And I have to say there are other, a number of other student publications and blogs and you name it. Sure. Uh, what, what advice do you give to students who are considering careers in the media? Yeah, so uh, what, what, I, what I say to them now is, um, first of all, follow your passion, uh, yet you wanna wake up every day and do something you love. So if you, if you uh, whatever, whatever, role you, you want to pursue, make sure you're passionate about it. If you're interested in media, uh, you know, there are so many more opportunities and ways to go today than there ever were before. You don't have to end up at CNN. You don't have to go to NBC. You don't have to go to ABC. Uh, you know, you can, you, can, uh, you can start your own blog. You can uh, go to work for uh, uh, many new forms of of distribution, there are great places like uh, Axios and and BuzzFeed and 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 the Athletic. If you're interested in sports, and and so it doesn't just have to be about CNN or, or NBC. The other thing I would say is, if you're interested in in media, uh, uh, it's good to have a journalism background, but it's not it's not absolutely necessary. You don't have to major in journalism. You don't have to work at the Brown Daily Herald, uh, uh, Brown Daily. Uh, you don't have to, um, but it's also, you, you can also do it. I majored in American history and that helps me every day. And so you can do it through a liberal arts education. History helps me every day. You have to be, uh, you just have to be interested in the world. Uh, and I think that's what a great liberal arts education is about. That's what makes a great journalist be a little skeptical and don't feel like you have to come to CNN. Uh, it's great to come to CNN. But, but uh, there's so many more ways today to be a journalist, to do, go into podcasting, to go into social, uh, social distribution, uh, to go to uh, new sites that have, that have propped up. Uh, follow your passion. That's how you're going to wake up every day and be excited to go to work. So, so let me, I'm going to go to a couple of the questions. There are a lot of them coming in, which is terrific. And some of them touch a little bit on things we already discussed, but maybe in a slightly different way. So first one, um, thank you for coming, it says. And then when John Kasich, a senior political commentator on your network, came to speak at Brown, he alluded to the notion of, quote, narrow casting, because our major networks choose to showcase issues to cover and commentate in rather divergent and predictable fashion. Those who only watch one network manifest into, quote, narrow thinkers, to what extent do you find this to be true? How do you as an executive work to ensure ideological diversity in not only people, 
but in time dedicated in the news cycle. Yeah, as the questioner noted, John Kasich uh, is, a, is a senior political commentator for CNN. Listen, part of what I've tried to do at CNN is to make sure that different points of view are represented. Uh, and I do think that this is what, uh, I think there's a lot of things that distinguish us from our, our, our television news competitors, uh, especially in the cable space where uh, our, our direct competitors in, in the cable news space are much more ideological right and left. I've tried to ensure that we have you know, and I've taken a lot of heat uh, through the years for making sure that that we represented uh, the Trump point of view, for instance. And I've hired, you know, commentators who are very supportive of Donald Trump. Uh, I believe that if you don't hear that point of view, you wake up the morning after the election and they're surprised that Donald Trump was elected. And uh, and so, you know, I think it's been important to have different points of view. John Kasich is not somebody who supports Donald Trump, right? So I felt that we needed to have people who supported Donald Trump. It's important that we have people who support, uh, like John Kasich, uh, a more traditional Republican point of view, and then, and then Democratic points of view. And, uh, and I think that's how you avoid uh, narrow casting, and that's how you avoid just listening to an echo chamber. But I've taken a lot of heat. I've taken a lot of criticism over the last few years for being willing to have Trump supporters on our air. And I, I, I disagree with that, but you know, uh, that I think is, a, is emblematic of what's going on in society today, where people only wanna hear what they wanna hear. So, so there's a really fascinating question that's somewhat related from an undergraduate student who's affiliated with several student publications. And the student asks, to what extent is the news media currently using algorithms rather than human decision-making to decide what types of news should be prioritized for airtime yeah. and what will this look like in 10 years? So yeah. you know, I think the backdrop to this question, at least the way I read it is, are you simply yeah. really just focusing on what news is going to drive viewership, which is going to drive revenue? Yeah. So it's a totally good question. Uh, I will say that um, on, our, uh, t on the television network, we're not using any algorithm at all. Uh, what, what we're using is, uh, is my gut, my gut and, uh, and, the, and the collective experience of, of my, you know, the people who I work with. Uh, and, you know, that's how we determine what we're gonna cover and, uh, and how much time we're gonna spend on it. On our digital platform, it is the same thing, except there we do obviously follow uh, much more closely uh, what is driving traffic and what and what what people are um, gravitating to and and so if we if, if there when we see that we obviously that does tell us something and and we do try to capitalize on that but but we don't rely solely on that I will say and you know there are many times where I'll say I don't care that that you know, this isn't the number one driver of traffic digitally, I want to prioritize it. So the answer is in 10 years, I think much, you know, right now, as we know, in the, in the social media, in the social platforms, you know, uh, they are totally driven by algorithms. In the next 10 years in media space, I think it will be more driven by algorithms. But for now, uh, I still rely on my gut. That's good. And do you think it'll become more personalized? Like yes, there's, you know, no the question, algorithms yeah, are, there's no question media yeah. over the next 10 years will be much more personalized and, and we'll be able to know exactly what you want and, and, and drive that to you. Right, right. Okay, so here's a good question from a faculty member of Modern Culture and Media, and I'm going to read it word for word. Uh, would you trace the editorial transformation that ultimately allowed CNN journalists to use the word, quote, lie instead of other euphemisms when reporting on false statements by government officials? Well, uh, I don't know if there was, uh, I don't know if there was a, you know, a natural evolution uh, that I could really trace, except, uh, you know, I think over time, over time, uh, I just felt um, that, um, we shouldn't tiptoe around what was happening. And, uh, and so at the end of the day, obviously, um, uh, 
if something is a lie, something is a lie. And I don't think we should use a euphemism for it. And at the end of the day, uh, I was comfortable with giving approval to call it a lie. You know, if something's a lie, it's a lie. And, uh, and you know, I think what this is getting at is, uh, you know, there, there's, I believe our, our uh, approach at CNN is to be pro-truth. It's not, it's not to be pro-Trump or anti-Trump or pro-Biden or anti-Biden uh, or, or, you know, or anything like that. It's to be pro-truth. Now, I do understand why being pro-truth can sometimes come off as anti-Trump, uh, but that's because they, they have an issue with the truth and, uh, and that is not something that we're going to apologize for. If it's a lie, it's a lie, and we're going to call it a lie. There wasn't, a, there wasn't a, a, an evolution per se. It was just over time, uh, I didn't want to tiptoe around. I didn't want to tiptoe anymore around what was happening. Yeah, I mean, do you think at all the end of euphemism has something to do with the uh, we have a president who speak, you know, fake news. Uh, the, yeah. way, the, the, the method of speaking is very direct, whether you yeah. like it or not. Yeah. And has that conditioned how the news sort of responds? Yeah, look, I mean, I don't think we're going to, uh, I, I, I'm sure that at some level, uh, his use of, of the fake news terms and, and enemy of the people and all of that, I'm sure that had some impact, right? Uh, but you know, it's still, it's still our job to be fair and whether, whether, whether that hurts our feelings or not, we yeah. still got to be fair, but just cause you're fair doesn't mean that you shouldn't call something a lie when it's a lie. Next question is on a kind of different topic, but in a, in a way it speaks to your comment earlier, which is we're all so absorbed with the pandemic that there's not much room for other things. Yeah. So the question is this, um, while climate change and dark money are issues of monumental importance, it seems channels like CNN spend proportionally very little time on them. This coverage in turn influences public perception and voting habits. How does CNN plan on addressing such priorities? Yeah, so look, I, 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 don't, uh, I don't really necessarily agree on the climate crisis uh, part of that question. I, I, in fact, I think we're the only television network that has a full-time cli uh, uh, climate correspondent uh, uh, who, who's uh, dedicated to that topic. We're the only network that, that did, uh, I believe it was six, a six-hour town hall uh, with every Democratic uh, uh, candidate on strictly on climate. Uh, uh, we're, we're uh, you know, we, we do an extraordinary amount of reporting on climate. Now, when you put it against the backdrop of, you know, 90%, 85% of our coverage is about the pandemic and, and all of that, it does, you know, it does get lost in the, in the big scheme of things. And I understand that. Uh, but I, I don't really accept that the climate uh, and the climate, we call it the climate crisis, right? We, we think that it's clear that it's changed. It's a climate crisis. Uh, uh, I, I think that we've done a, a good job of covering that. Uh, you know, for some, it'll never be enough. And I understand that. And that that's okay. Um, but but I, I actually am pretty proud of, of our, our coverage uh, of the climate. With regard to dark money and other issues that obviously, uh, you know, uh, are important. It is true that um, certainly this year, uh, the pandemic uh, has taken most of the attention. And uh, I don't feel defensive about that, uh, I, and I don't apologize for that. I think it's the story of our time. I mean, it's it's the story of this year. I know it's probably something that you spend most of your time dealing with, uh, and you couldn't have imagined that that would be the case. I never would have imagined that this would be the, the principal story we'd be covering this year, but it is, and I think it impacts every part of our lives and every part of society, and that has crowded out other stories that are clearly important, but, um, but they don't rise to the level of life and death that I think the coronavirus has. But is there, just to follow up on that question a bit, especially for something like the climate crisis, which is, 
monumental, I think, but also slow, relatively slow moving. It's not by itself making news on any given day. Uh, you have to go out and look for it and pull it in. Does it make it harder? Is it a harder thing to report on than something like the pandemic or an election, which is kind of... Yeah, right. I mean, I, I think your point is that there, there's not a daily event that, that, that drives coverage of, of climate. I, right. I, I mean, I think there are stories that you could do every day about the climate, but there's not a precipitating event that drives it. Yeah. And I, I think that that's, uh, that's a totally fair observation. Having said that, um, I don't think that, uh, you know, I think that we are out there looking for those stories. And, mm -hmm. and look, we, uh, as I said, we, we've been very committed to that story. And, uh, uh, you know, but it is, it, is, it is true also that it's been harder to break through in COVID-19. And uh, yeah. uh, we, we all, and that's the story of our time. And that's what's gotten you know, 85% of our, our coverage this year. And again, like I said, I think that's been the right decision. Next question. This is going back to the question of algorithms. You can see what members of the Brown community are interested in. Okay, that's good. Uh, if content continues to be more and more personalized, how do you ensure people see multiple sides and perspectives of the discussion? Won't that continue to polarize as people only see what they already agree with? Yeah, look, I, I do think that that is a little bit of an issue. And that's why I said earlier on that I think the, the social platforms are one of the reasons that we have become more, you know, siloed and, uh, you know, to our own echo chambers. Um, yeah, look, I think that, uh, I think that is an issue and, and I just think it's incumbent upon each of us to, uh, uh, to educate ourselves with as broad a, a media palette as we can and to, and to not just seek out uh, that echo chamber. Look, you know, I mean, this will be controversial, uh, 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 but I'll say it because I actually uh, feel strongly about this because it's about college campuses. It's, it's one of the reasons that I also think that we need to be tolerant of different points of view, even on college campuses. And I think that, I think one of the things that I think has been a little bit of a problem in the last decade or, uh, you know, last five years has been this move towards uh, not wanting to hear from people who we disagree with. And you know, if we can't, if we can't tolerate different points of view, especially on a college campus, uh, or on the editorial op-ed page of a newspaper, or from from a Trump supporter on CNN, then I think we're all in trouble because uh, we we only uh, uh, we only are as as good as our tolerance of, of different points of view, and I think that that is what America was born on. And, uh, and if we lose that, then I really think it's a problem for all of us. Yeah, yeah. I think that, I mean, the way I think about it is it's not tolerance. You, you don't have to agree with other people. Oh, right, oh, totally. But you have to be willing to listen to them and challenge them. Right, yeah. and that's what I mean by to yeah. tolerant to have yeah. them come speak on, on campus uh, or, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's something we work very hard at at Brown. Yeah. I think you do a good yeah. job. And that wasn't that wasn't a comment about Brown, by the way. No, 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 no. I, I won't take it personally. Yeah, no, 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 that, a lot that, of the questions I've asked you are not only about CNN. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's it's because I just feel that about college campuses in general. It, exactly, I understand. Um, so another question, and I think we have time for a few more. Uh, you've talked about the importance of local media and journalism. Do you have an opinion about the future of print? Is print future yeah. print? Yeah. Uh, I think it's unlikely that in 10 years there will be many uh, newspapers that are printed. Uh, I do think that that's going to, uh, you know, I don't know the exact time frame, but I think 10 years, uh, very unlikely that there'll be a lot of print. But are you saying that just means people will read the news on a device or yeah, some totally. other non Listen, the New York Times has never been more successful, but they've never had fewer people reading the actual hard, you know, hard, hard hard copy of the newspaper. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't think that the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal and the LA Times uh, are going away, but, uh, but I think that their hard, hard copy editions, their print editions probably will. So for our students who want to be writers, there's still hope, we're still going I actually to be think writers. there's more opportunity than ever. I think that there's more outlets to go to. And, and that was my point about if you want to, you know, be a writer, 
or a journalist, you don't just have to go to the New York Times. There are many different ways to express your, your passion. And, uh, and that's the beauty of, of society today, just because there's, so don't worry that there's not a, a hard copy. Okay, to your last point about tolerating speakers with divergent points of view on campus, how do you square that with not reporting, quote, lies? in the kind of forum with the speaker uninterrupted, it can be a forum for mistruths, not differing points of view. Well, I mean, uh, listen, I'm, I'm not suggesting that you should invite somebody to the college campus who's gonna come and just lie uh, or spew hate. But what I'm suggesting is that we invite to the college campus or on CNN or on an op-ed page, people who have differing points of view. I don't think that just because they have a different point of view means that they're lying, right? There's a difference between somebody who's lying and somebody who has a different point of view. Yes. And that's how I square that. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, so given the nature of your work and position, this is, this is one of the fun questions. Okay. Coming up. They're all fun, but- All good. I'm, I'm sure you have had really incredible once in a lifetime experiences What's been the highlight or highlights of your career so far and why? What's the most amazing experience you've had in your job? Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, uh, wow. Um, I don't know. I, I've been very fortunate. I, uh, uh, you know, some of the things that I remember, um, are uh, doing a six hour interview uh, uh, in the middle of the night with Fidel Castro. Uh, I remember, uh, I remember uh, get, getting shot at by the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. Uh, not, these are just things I remember. Not, these aren't necessarily the most you know, exciting. Uh, I mean, you know, look, uh, uh, one of the most memorable nights uh, of my life was the 2000 election when we called that election three times for, uh, you know, Gore and Bush. And, uh, you know, I remember that night uh, vividly. I, I've been unbelievably fortunate to meet the most incredible people, you know, uh, uh, being with Muhammad Ali on the night that he lit the, the flame at the 96 Olympics was a pretty, pretty special uh, thing. You know, I've uh, I've had the good fortune to meet you know every American president, uh, dating dating back a long way. That's been uh, uh, pretty uh, pretty exciting. Um, uh, I don't know. I've been very very That's fortunate. That's a good list. That's a good list. That's, yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty, I've been pretty fortunate. With Fidel Castro. So, so let me ask you a question, which is probably impossible to answer, but it's something we're thinking about on the Brown campus, clearly, which is we have this election coming up. We have no idea when we're going to find out who actually won it. I mean, the state rules really widely differ. And, you know, we're kind of thinking, how do we prepare for this event? Um, how are you preparing for this election? And do you have any, like, what's your hunch on how things are, are we going to know by two in the morning or not? Yeah, so um, we are preparing that it's not just going to be election day or election night. We're preparing that it's probably election week. Yeah. And we have built our, our programming and our, our, our capacity that week so that we are going to be in full election returns programming for the full week. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, we're ready for that. Now, having said that, we could know, we could know uh, by 2 a.m. Uh, on election night. It's possible. It's conceivable. So, um, you know, it just depends how it breaks. Uh, and I think, you know, we're ready. We're ready to go the full week, and we'll be ready to call it at 2 a.m. if that's the way it breaks. Um, so we'll just have to see. I, I think, you know, the beauty of the first draft of history is we just don't know yet. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay, I have one last question for you, uh, which is this. The pandemic has impacted every aspect of our lives, financially, socially, mentally. Nielsen studies are also showing that our consumption of media is increasing 
homebound consumers have led to a 60% increase in the amount of video content watched globally. That's a lot, is that true? Um, what do you think the long-term effects of this increase will be? Is it gonna stick? Is it gonna go away? Yeah. So I, I do think that this has fundamentally changed the way that we all consume uh, you know, entertainment and video and, and, and all of that. Uh, I do think that, you know, it may not be exactly at this level, but I do think it's changed. I think that uh, it's unclear whether the, whether any of us will ever go to the movies again, the way we have, for instance, and we'll consume, there'll still be movies. We'll just watch them, you know, on our, our screens at home. Uh, uh, you know, and there may be certain movies we still go to in the theater, but, but I think that has changed. I think that uh, the direct to consumer streaming services that we all uh, utilize, whether it's uh, HBO Max or Netflix or, or Apple or Hulu or Amazon, uh, I think those are going to play a much bigger role in all of our lives. And, and, uh, and uh, that's the way we will consume uh, entertainment and, and video in a much bigger way. I do think that that's problematic for traditional outlets like the broadcast networks and, and entertainment cable networks. And, um, and I think that, I think the only, I think live news and sports uh, that, that, that I work in right now will, will continue to be uh, something that people consume in the way that they have. But, uh, but that I do think that the pandemic has accelerated changes that were going to come uh, in the next five to 10 years and accelerated them to the point where they're now with us and they're here for good. I think that's true in a lot of industries. I right. think certainly it's true in higher ed. So not right. that we're going all online forever, don't worry. No, I, I understand. But, but I think, I think like, look, I do think that the pandemic combined with technology has accelerated the pace of, pace of change in a way that was probably inevitable, but uh, uh, is now here. Well, look, let me just wrap up. I want to thank you for coming and thank you for your, uh, uh, just your remarks, really interesting. And I hope to see you around campus in person someday. Well, well, one, uh, thank you for inviting me. I really enjoyed talking with you. And two, uh, thanks for all you're doing uh, at Brown. Uh, I think you all have done a tremendous job. And I too look forward to being able to walk around campus uh, in, a, in a much bigger way in the years to come. So I look forward to that. Thank you so much. Take care. Yeah.